Okay. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Control Systems. Today, uh, we'll start as usual from uh, some administrative notes. There's not much to say, just that, as you all, mentioned, as you all noticed, uh, we didn't really have uh, an exercise session last week. Um, we will provide some exercises in the next uh, exercise session. Probably the TAs won't go through them. We'll have to look at them on your own, but at least you have something to practice on. Um, so, what's going on at this point in the class? Uh, we have started talking about controls, right? And uh, um, after going through all the basics of the analysis and seeing uh, what are the really important things for controllers, we ended up doing, uh, starting to ask ourselves, yes, but how do we actually design controllers that can uh, achieve all the, all the nice properties that we talked about before? And uh, in the previous classes, we started from the most uh, uh, intuitive or naive, if you want, uh, 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 point in which we said, okay, we have some uh, nasty new problem that we don't really know what, uh, how to deal with, and that's uh, control of MIMO systems. And uh, we asked ourselves, well, can we actually rephrase this problem somehow into, into, into a form that we know how to treat, uh, which is all the single input, single output uh, control system theory? So we said, well, um, yes, maybe, sometimes it's possible, sometimes not. It depends on the level of interaction between the different channels of a MIMO system, right? Because we understood at this point that the whole, quid, the, the whole problem of MIMO systems is that they have these multiple inputs, multiple outputs, different channels. These channels sometimes interact, sometimes not, depending on the structure of the uh, trans transfer function matrix. And uh, therefore, we, 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 we went and, see, uh, and, and, and the, the looked at a tool, the relative gain array, that allowed us to quantify what these, uh, uh, the degree of interaction between the different channels. And we figured out that if these uh, degree of interaction was small, in the sense if uh, uh, the system was, uh, was diagonally dominant, we say in the sense that uh, there are some uh, pairings between specific inputs and specific outputs that are not influenced by the other channels, then it made sense to actually solve the problem in the way that we knew how to solve it, that is, with a bunch of different uh, CISO controllers. And we called that decouple, uh, decentralized control. And then we said, okay, but what if that's not the case? Well, if that's not the case, then let's try to um, add a filter, add a transformation, add some sort of mathematical operation that allows us to put ourselves in that situation of decentralized control. And we called this the decoupling control. And while we were looking at different options for decoupling control, we understood a couple, uh, a very, one important thing, which is, uh, yes, you can do decoupling control when you have a, um, when you have an inverse-based approach to your, to your system, that is, if you knew how to cancel out completely the dynamics of the plant you want to control, well, then you can substitute it with pretty much whatever you want. It's always the good old idea of how do you make a brick wall fly, right? So, of course, that idea, as we saw very at the beginning of the class and in the few a few lectures ago, of course, has its merits, it's interesting, it's theoretically relevant, but uh, it typically runs into a bunch of, of, of uh, practical issues. Uh, the biggest one being model uncertainty. If there are three things you want to remember out of this course at the end of the class, well, one of these has to be model uncertainty. It has to be that all models are wrong, but some are useful. It has to be that you can do all the calculations you want, but most of controls is based on a model of the plant, and typically your understanding of what is actually going on is limited. It's partially correct, partially not. Different situations could be you don't know the high-frequency behavior, uh, or, or maybe you have some unmodeled dynamics, or maybe there's something else going on that you didn't even think about. Uh, but having uh, basing a control system on the concept of uh, uh, perfect cancellation of what is there and substitution with what, something that we want typically has its limitations. So we looked at this uh, uh, internal model control approach, which, is, uh, which was a way to, to, to somehow address this problem. And uh, it addresses it by encapsulating some sort of, uh, by distinguishing between what's the real model that we want to control, what's the perturbed plant, the real plant, and a knowledge, I mean, an, a, a, an actual model that allows us uh, to predict what the output was. And at that point, we uh, fed back to the controller 
not only the measured output of the system, which is what we were used to do all the time since the beginning of our experience in controls, but what we fed back to the system was the difference between the prediction based on our mathematical understanding of the problem and the actual uh, output of the system. Consider that the actual output of the system, as we've seen in the uh, control blocks that you all now uh, remember by heart, the, the, the real output of a system includes a bunch of uncertainties, which could be the model, uh, the model uncertainty, as we mentioned before, but even measurement noises, various disturbances, and things like this. So through internal modeling control, we saw that it makes sense to feed back the uncertainty of the system to the plant, to the controller. That is the difference between the prediction and the measurement. And uh, we saw that uh, um, in, in the best case of scenarios, uh, internal modeling control, in fact, was a form of decoupling control because uh, we had the perfect uh, solution coming always from an inverse of the plant. Well, that said, uh, we then moved on and said, okay, but what if... Um, now we, 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 we think about some better way. We, we, we noticed that if we feed back the system output, we can do our controls, our PID, our loop shaping, and all of that. If we feed back the difference between the prediction and the output, well, we can do something a little bit cooler. So it's natural to ask the question, but is there an optimal signal? Is there uh, something even better to feed back that, that allows us to do controls in a much more efficient way? So we looked at the state of a system. Now, because at the end of the day, it's not that we have much choices. When we look at our, uh, our linear time invariant uh, equations of, of the models, all, I mean, all, everything we're doing is based on the assumption that we're controlling a linear time invariant system. X dot equals AX plus BU, and Y equals a CX. Well, really, you only have two signals there. One is the Y, one is the X. So we've been doing everything with the Y. What, what happens if we do it with the X? And in last class, so we, we started talking about state feedback. And state feedback, uh, we noticed that was really nice because, uh, because it allowed us to do this thing of called pole placement in the sense that uh, we could literally go and uh, change the poles of the, of the eigenvalues of the A matrix, which are the poles of the, of the uh, closed loop transfer function. And those are the numbers that actually determine the dynamics of the system. It's what, uh, what it's, it's, it makes or breaks the deal, right? So if we have a way to uh, whatever the poles are, just to substitute them with what we want, uh, that's amazing because it means we can basically control whatever we want in the way we want. And uh, so uh, we didn't really get to that, uh, to the last slide at the end of last class, but I'll, I'll, I'll show it today. The idea of... Uh, um, Pole placement works by uh, pole cancellation. So what the controller, the feedback controller does is removes the old poles and adds the new ones, the ones you desire. And of course, this again is based on an, in, uh, an understanding uh, of exactly what's going on in your plant. Again, model uncertainty is the one thing you want to remember. If you have an uncertain model, you probably have an un uncertain understanding of what the poles of the system are, and therefore relying on exact pole cancellation doesn't look like a good idea. So just to briefly recap some of the things we looked at last uh, class, again, we have the internal model control approach. What, what really uh, should be the takeaway of this, of this, uh, of this uh, part of the class is that we're no longer feeding back just the, the output of the system, the measured output, where we're feeding back something that is the difference between the output and, the, and the, this, which is the prediction of our output. It's a prediction, why? Because the model is something we know for sure. It's what we decide uh, how to describe the system. So once you have a mathematical equation of a process, well, you can pretty much do whatever you want with it. No? You can even propagate it in the future and see and, 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 and try to predict what's going on. So first big takeaway, we're feeding back the uh, uncertainty. Second big, big takeaway is we are comparing in the same control loop what the plant is and actual our model is. And so we saw that under some simplifying assumptions, that is, uh, uh, if we had a perfect understanding of the model, then uh, we could achieve uh, uh, ideal control. That is, uh, the uh, reference uh, is exactly equal to the output only by doing uh, a plant inversion. And this was the link with the decoupling control approaches we saw before. 
We then moved on to state feedback. So what's the big uh, deal here is that, well, we're feeding back the state. We're not feeding back the output anymore. And, uh, and we assumed that we know what the state was, OK? And this is another assumption we're going to do today. Today, we're going to continue assuming that somebody gives us the state. Uh, somehow, oh, actually, this has a name. It's called the uh, full information hypothesis. The full information hypothesis means uh, we know all the state. And of course, this is a big hypothesis because it doesn't really happen in, 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 in real world. Um, in fact, the next class is all going to be about how do we deal with this hypothesis? How do we actually get the state so that we can apply all the good stuff we've seen in the previous class and that we're going to see today? So through state feedback, we saw that uh, uh, we could actually go and uh, affect directly what the A matrix is, that is, what's the closed loop uh, uh, transfer function of the system. And we saw that we could uh, uh, literally replace the existing poles with something that we arbitrarily sat down and wrote as what is our desired uh, polynomial characteristic of the closed loop transfer function. So we said, ah, oh, let's just write it down uh, in a way that, uh, that uh, uh, it has as a solution the actual pose of the system. And then uh, we will uh, figure out what the K, that is the controller, is in order to achieve these, uh, these uh, uh, poles. And uh, we did a couple examples, I don't know if you remember, in which we took a system and we had that beta number and we said, look, if we change these numbers, if there is some weird relationship between the B matrix, that is the matrix that relates how the inputs affect the states, and the A matrix, which is, go governs the evolution of the states, then sometimes you can do post placements and sometimes not. And it turns out that uh, the, necessary and uh, the necessary and sufficient condition to do post placement is having reachability of the system. That is, uh, uh, the fact that there actually exists a control that allows you to pick your state and move it around as you wish. And we saw that there is uh, an easy test that we can do, and we build something called the reachability matrix this, that, that is represented here. And uh, we, eva we evaluate the rank of this matrix, and if the rank of this matrix matches the order of the system, that is n, then we're game, we're good. Uh, we can do pole placement. If not, well, um, if not, then, then we should discuss in the sense that uh, uh, if a system is reachable, it means all its states can be affected by the inputs, which is great. If it's not reachable, it doesn't mean you can't do it. It means uh, probably there is a part of the states that can be reached and part not, or maybe none of them. That depends on the actual system. Uh, we didn't get in the details of that, but uh, today we're going to have a little bit of a scratch on that problem, the surface of that problem as well. We noticed that uh, there is actually a way to, uh, uh, there's this problem of realization, which is, okay, what if I give you a transfer? So we all know that if you're given the dynamical equations of a system, that is x dot equals ax plus bu, you can find the transfer function, right? If you have uh, um, x dot, x dot equals ax plus bu, and you have y equals cx so plus du, but let's forget about the du part, then you can actually derive the transfer function in a straightforward way. You've seen this proof a thousand times. I'm not going to do it again. Uh, but what if you want to do the reverse problem? What if you're giving a transfer function and you want to find ABC that represents that problem? Well, uh, this is, a, is, a, is something called the realization problem. There are many different solutions. But uh, we can then find some solutions that, for example, guarantee the reachability, which is something that we like. So we just said, look, there is a way to write down the A, B, C, and uh, the A, B, and C matrices such that the system is always in a so-called reachable canonical form. That is the standard form that is for sure guaranteed to be reachable. So this is the slide we didn't really see last time. Um, we, I, I'm not going to go through it in detail. This is a sketch, basically, of the proof of the Ackermann formula. No, so the Ackermann formula uh, was one of the last things we saw last class. And uh, what was it all about? It was about uh, finding an easy way, uh, a, a, a convenient mathematical formulation to do this pole placement problem in, 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 a, in, a, in a standardized way. Um, because we saw that, sure, you can do it by just calculating by, hands, by hand things. But it works well when we are doing the toy problems of two-by-two two systems, but try to do it with a 
with a real system that has 10, 15 states, and you could spend the rest of your life doing calculations. So the Ackerman formula is actually a relatively uh, simple one-stop solution to do pole placement. Um, so just to, to highlight the concept that I was mentioning before, so suppose that you have a system that is written in, a control or can, in reachable canonical form. And you just apply the uh, definition of state feedback like we did in the first exercises last time. So you actually write out what is your uh, A minus BK matrix. So your coefficients of the controller are undetermined values that you want to figure out. And uh, once you have the closed loop transfer function that is written like this, you notice that uh, the poles of the system are represented in the lower, um, so if we look at the reachable canonical form, we see that the stability of the system is all function of the, of the zeros of the de denominator of the transfer function, right? So these coefficients A1, A0, and so on. And all these coefficients appear at the last row of A. So if we apply state feedback to a reachable canonical form, we know that we're going to change the poles. It's just fair that we get the k that, um, that uh, goes and affects those numbers. So uh, in order to figure out what are the values of the controller that actually allow us to place the poles how we want, we just uh, do a matching between what is our desired characteristic, characteristic polynomial and what is the uh, actual one. And what do we see? We see that in order for the uh, poles to be the values we want, K has to be chosen in such a way, I'm not sure why this, okay. The Ks have to be exactly the value that you desire. This is the desired value minus the actual value. And, uh, and so what is this? How is it working? What is the principle that allows pole placement to work? It's something called uh, pull cancellation, okay? So if here you see uh, K, you just make it uh, the desired value minus uh, the actual one, then uh, what goes on here is you have minus A0, minus uh, A0 star, plus minus A0, where this is your K, your K value, K1. And so what the real poles of the systems just cancel out and you have what you want. So, but this idea of pole cancellation is, again, risky because if it assumes that you know your model well, what if you have model uncertainty? What if your A0 is not really an A0? It's an A0 plus minus delta plus minus something, okay? Because there's model uncertainty, you don't really know how to model the plant. Then this pole cancellation won't, won't, won't really give the, effect, the desired effect because you're not exactly canceling out what you want. Does this make any sense? Maybe? Yes? So the bottom line is model uncertainty is a problem even for state feedback, okay? So what are we going to do today? Today we're going to look at a way to basically always do pole placement, but doing pole placement in a robust way. Not only a robust way, but a way that allows the designer, the control guy, the controllist, the, the engineer, call it as you want, allows the, the, the designer not to focus on the details, nitty-gritty details of the design. That is, ah, where do I want to put the poles? Does it make sense to put it on minus two, or should I put a complex conjugate, or whatever it is? No, all you're going to deal with is uh, what is the final output that you would like. Would you like, it, uh, would you like your system to be very performant in the sense that it tracks your signal, your reference signal better? Would you prefer instead having a, uh, a cheap control in the sense you want to spend less energy of your input in order to achieve that tracking? Do you just want to find any arbitrary balance between the two? And uh, so uh, this problem is formulated as, as uh, something called a, a linear quadratic control problem. It could be formulated as a particular case of a bigger theory called H2 control, but we're not going to deal about that. In, uh, we're not going to talk about that. Today we're going to focus in particular on the problem of linear quadratic regulator. So the idea is don't worry about the details, but worry about what you want to achieve at the end. How do you do that? By writing a cost function. And uh, we look at this, we, looked, we introduced this last class, and we said, uh, um, so 
what if uh, now we write our, our, our system in this way? We have, uh, we're not focusing on the transfer function anymore, but we're focusing on the actual state space equations of the system. And we don't consider the, the, the output, which is something that is uh, typically determined by the actual system, right? So the measured outputs of your system, the Ys up there, are something that uh, are given to you depending on where you can plug in the different sensors. So sometimes you get exactly what you want, sometimes the system is such that you, don't, you can't measure exactly what you care to control. Um, so we come up with this, uh, um, uh, this, this uh, controlled output, which is an arbitrary combination of the states. And, uh, of course, the controlled output could be selected in such a way that it just matches the measured output, or it could be selected in such a way that you go and weight some different states through the, through the E matrix. And, uh, and the whole point is that we now focus only on the cost function. And the cost function, what is it? It's, it's, it's a functional, actually, not a function, in the sense that it gets as inputs signals and not numbers. But apart from this detail, it's a measurement of something bad, something you want to minimize. Okay? So, for example, you could uh, want to minimize the sum, or a weighted sum, actually, between the two norm of your input. Remember that a two norm is always... Uh, can be interpreted as a, as, as a measurement of the energy of a signal. So uh, saying the two-norm of the input is, is, is actually a way to mathematically formulate what's your cost to do control. Why? Because the input typically requires, a, I mean, matches some physical, some physical quantity. Uh, you're running motors to do something, well, the input is, is a voltage signal. A voltage signal means you have to plug it in the wall and pay an electric bill at the end of the day. So, well, you might want to have a cheap control in order to, 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 to have some level of performance. Or another example could be, well, guess if you want to maybe send a rocket to, to Mars or to the moon. Uh, the cost of the input is how much burst, how much thrust you need to generate, or how when do you shoot in the different parts of the mission to actually achieve your objective. That's really costly, because the more fuel you put in your rocket, the bigger the rocket has to be, and, 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 and the prices go up. So worrying about the cost of control is relevant. And uh, on the other side, we compare it with this uh, uh, two norm of the, of the controlled output, which you can imagine as being the difference between your output and a zero signal. Okay? And actually, this problem is formulated implicitly. You see there is no reference to signal here. It's implicitly uh, defined in such a way that we're trying to, to track the zero signal. Okay? That's, that's, that's the problem of regulation. That's why it's called a linear quadratic regulator. It's linear because the system is linear. It's x dot equals ax plus bu. This is a linear time invariant system. Uh, it's uh, quadratic because the cost function is quadratic. It's, uh, it's based on, uh, on squares of two norms, and we will see today what does it mean to have a quadratic form and why is it relevant. And it's a regulator because we're trying to solve the problem of regulation that is tracking a zero reference, basically. So, um, of course, this row is nothing but a number. Let's call it positive just for convenience. And it's a way that allows us to trade off between what we consider, we designers consider uh, to be more important between the tracking performances and the cost of our input. Consider that this is a uh, cost function. So it's not given by somebody. It's not like there are some theoretical considerations that impose us to write the cost function like this. The nice thing about these new methods of controls that we're going to do today and, uh, and in the next classes is that the cost function is arbitrary. You can decide what the cost function is. Um, what we will see today is we'll try to write a relative general formulation of the cost function, but keep in mind that if you decide that you want to add another term for any reason, that's perfectly possible. You just follow the same procedure, and you might get to some result that is mathematically treatable, or maybe not, and at that point you'll have to do lots of simulations. But, so, Let's try to understand a little bit more about the, what's the general formulation of this problem. So first, like, let's start really from the basics. What is a two-norm? Like, we introduced two norms a while back. Uh, I don't count on the fact that you remember. But suppose that uh, your U signal is actually, so uh, I, it's kind of obvious. I have not said it, but maybe it's worth explicitating. 
This works very well with MIMO systems, okay? We have made no assumptions here that the system is CISO, okay? It could have mm, N components of the input, uh, M components, sorry, L components of the input and M components of the output. So when we have the two norm of a signal, what, what do we really say? Let's suppose the signal is actually a U1 of T and a U2 of T. Well, when we write the two norm, what we're doing is we're doing U transpose U, which means uh, U1, U2, times u1, u2, like this. And this is really nice because if you do the matrix multiplications, you get u1 square plus u2 square. See why it's quadratic? Because it has a quadratic form associated with the two norm. And this is always a positive value, right? It has uh, no, it's homogeneous in the sense it has no, uh, no um, um, uh, constant terms added to it. And uh, so what happens if we want to now have an idea on uh, weighting the two, uh, the two different channels of the input or of the controlled output uh, specifically? We can just use the notation of adding a, a, a matrix at the bottom of the two norm. And what we really mean is that we're adding this weighting matrix at the, at the center of this uh, quadratic form, okay? So in general, of course, uh, this weighting matrix could be any random mess and uh, this would give you some relative weighting between the channels of your input. But uh, for example, if we were to choose the, the, this weighting matrix to be a diagonal matrix with different terms on the diagonal, then you would uh, see that what you're doing is you're just getting the same form as the, the same quadratic form, but each channel is now weighted with a different signal, okay? So this is just a way to generalize a little bit more the problem and say, look, you don't just need to uh, weigh all the different uh, controlled outputs or your different uh, input channels in the same way. You can just by adding a, a, a weighting matrix in the middle, you can, you can actually give preference to some channels or not. So we just reformulate the same problem that we did before, but uh, uh, we add the, some weighting matrices here to give us more degrees of freedom, okay? And uh, so how does this uh, work out? Well, if, uh, if uh, we just look at this, uh, uh, we start from the problem of RJ being the, in can you read up there? Yes, maybe, no? Let's say RJ is better is equal the integral of what? Of these uh, uh, weighted the two norms, right? So we just look at the weighted two norms. What does it mean? It means uh, Z transpose, we called it Q bar times Z plus rho U transpose R bar times U in DT, okay? This means that now Z, we know that it is uh, uh, equal to what? To EX plus FU by definition. Transpose Q times EX plus FU plus rho U transpose R bar, this is a Q bar, U in DT, okay? So today is gonna be a mathy class, so please double check my passages. It's very possible that I'm gonna, do yes, sir. So Z is uh, defined to be in this way, okay? So the Z is, a, it, it's a controlled output, okay? And it's defined in such a way that is what you intend to control at the end, which is different from what you measure. The measurement is given by the real system, by the, 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 the practicalities of the, of the problem you're dealing with. But maybe you, your, your measurement, Y equals uh, CX, is such that C, I don't know, is one, zero, okay? which means that uh, you are just controlling the signal. I'm doing a mess here. So suppose that your C matrix is one zero. This means that what you're really measuring is only the state X1, okay? But maybe what you want to control is X2 or X1 plus X2 or any other combination, three X1 minus four X2, okay? So you just uh, introduce this uh, artificial signal that allows you to do a weighting and, uh, and it's, just distinguish the problem from the actual practical situation, but focusing on what is it the intent of the of the of the controller of the control list. Sorry, the person that wants to uh, make the design. So, what's going on here? Um, so here we're just going to do the calculations now. 
you all know that if you take the transpose of a product of two matrices, this is equal to B transpose A transpose. You just need to make sure you are inverting the order of the matrices. So this is X transpose E transpose plus U transpose F transpose time Q bar. I'll just put it directly. So here Q bar E X plus Q bar F U plus row U transpose R bar U and DT. So now we'll just do the multiplications and uh, rearrange. So let's do some multiplication. X transpose E transpose times this. What is it? It's X transpose E transpose. What's going on with this? Pen? X transpose E transpose times Q bar times E times X plus plus um, X transpose E transpose Q bar F U plus U transpose F transpose Q bar E X plus plus U transpose F transpose Q bar F U plus row U transpose R bar U DT, right? Did I miss any term? No. So now what are we going to do? We're just going to uh, rearrange things in such a way that we have X transpose times what? So one term is going to be X transpose is going to be the quadratic term in X. So we have uh, uh, this component here. And what else? We have, uh, oh, that's pretty much it. So E transpose Q bar E times x. Then we have a quadratic form in U, trans in U which is going to include which terms? We have uh, this term here and this term here, right? So this is U transpose, F transpose Q bar F plus rho R bar times U plus this other last term that uh, um, is equal. You see there is a so note one thing. When we write this uh, to norm, okay, what do you get as a result? If you, so the input is a signal. It's a U of T, right? What's the output? It's the sum of different terms. But the sum of different terms are scalars. They're not vectors. They're not matrices. It's a number. It's the energy of the signal. It's 10, it's 15, it's 20, okay? So this term here and uh, this term here, they are scalars. So what's the point? A scalar is always equal to its transpose, right? Because it doesn't really make any sense to take the transpose of a scalar. It's itself. So we can just take the transpose of one of the two, for example, of this the second term here, and rewrite this as uh, uh, two x transpose um, e transpose q bar times f times u in dt. So this just to show you that we get exactly these terms here, where all we're doing is we are renaming now the big uh, uh, terms we have in these parentheses as r, q, and e, and n. And the definitions are given here. OK? So what is one important, very important thing that I uh, didn't mention? It's that in order to ensure that this cost remains quadratic, that is, uh, we have uh, these uh, sums of the quadratic forms that are still positive, we ask our weighting matrices to be symmetric and uh, something called um, and definite positive, positive definite. So does anybody of you know what a positive definite matrix is? Yes, one person. <laughs> you went to special course. <laughs> okay, so I'm glad I, 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 I uh, will talk about this a little bit. So before getting into all the details of what we're going to do for the rest of the class, uh, this is the solution, okay? So if at the end you want to review everything just by having one slide, 
This is just rephrasing of the whole problem. Comments, questions, or doubts? No? So this is what the final solution will be. Today, we're going to actually derive this. We're going to look at uh, why does this problem have a solution in the form of state feedback? Why is the state feedback, the, the K of the state feedback, actually that weird, messy thing? And uh, how do we achieve this? Okay. So this is just a slide for you to, to go back and see everything at glance in one page after, after we're done going through all the details. So what is a positive definite? So you'll, you'll see here that um, we said that these weighting matrices have to be positive definite, and we don't really know what this means. We see that the conditions for the system to, for the problem to actually have a solution, which we'll explain throughout the class today, one is the, 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 the stabilizability, which is a form of reachability. We'll talk about it later. Pretty much we know what it is. We have this concept of detectable that we are not really sure what it is, so we'll have to look into this as well. And uh, although it's relatively straightforward to find an expression of what's the gain to do to make the linear quadratic regulator work, it's, uh, it is very, very uh, not straightforward actually finding out what this number is, because it's a function of a matrix P that comes out from the solution of this very nasty big equation, which is called an algebraic Riccati equation. And it's basically the way to write uh, 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 second degree equations with matrices. And today we're going to spend a lot of time trying to understand where this comes from and how to solve it. So what is a positive definite matrix? A positive definite matrix is uh, a matrix which uh, uh, has an associated quadratic form that is positive for every uh, uh, different vector different from zero that is being used. So what does this mean? Suppose we have a matrix M that is uh, M11, M12, M21, and M22. Then uh, we create this quadratic um, form by just uh, uh, doing the calculation we saw before. It's basically the weighted to norm. If this value is strictly positive for all possible z vectors that are just some arbitrary vectors of compatible uh, dimension, then we call the matrix positive definite. If instead uh, it's, uh, uh, this, uh, there exists uh, some, uh, some combinations uh, such that this value is not just a strictly positive, but it could be even equal to zero, then it's called semi-positive definite. And um, a matrix is defined as positive negative instead, if its opposite is positive definite. And uh, so we can, uh, these, these, these uh, positive definite matrices are nice because they allow us to, um, they have some nice mathematical properties that are, are going to come in handy. And it's typically uh, okay to just uh, uh, think about them as symmetric matrices. Because literally, without loss of generality, you can uh, transform a random matrix into a, into a symmetric matrix. If you take, when, when you look at the quadratic form associated with, uh, with uh, uh, a random matrix M, so here M is just a matrix without any assumption, we can just express this as the sum of the same thing divided by two, which is trivial. And uh, again, remember that, say, if M is a two by two, then the z vector is a is a what? The z vector is a uh, two by one, so that you've got a one by two times two by two times two by one. This means that the result is a one by one. It's a scalar. Every time you have a scalar, you can always take the tra a scalar is always equal to its transpose. So we can take the transpose of this of this part here. And if you check, it is, it is exactly the same as this. So because you would have to flip the order of the, of, the, of the terms as we've seen before. So it would be this Z goes here and becomes a Z transpose, but it's already there. And then we have M transpose and Z. You can just then gather left and right to the Z transpose and Z. And you see that you have uh, this quadratic form is equivalent to expressing M as the sum of M half plus M transpose half. And... Uh, I'll leave it as an exercise for you to verify that this M bar function, this M bar matrix is actually symmetric. How do you do that? Well, just take the transpose and verify that it's the same thing. 
So the quadratic form of uh, any matrix M from which we did no assumptions is always equal to the quadratic form of the associated symmetric matrix. So from now on, we'll just assume that quadratic forms are based on symmetric matrices. Um, so how do you check if a matrix is positive definite? So one of the, um, the, 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 the most straightforward ways of doing it is evaluating the eigenvalues. If all the eigenvalues of a function are positive definite, are positive, then the function, the matrix is positive definite. But that could be tricky. Uh, we all know that evaluating eigenvalues is something we've done a lot, but it's even something that is tedious and it becomes easily messy when the, when the matrix becomes bigger. So there's this thing called the Sylvester criterion that comes in handy in this case. And the Sylvester criterion tells us that uh, uh, we can uh, tell if a matrix is positive definite just by looking at the leading principal minors. So suppose that we have a matrix P that is, I don't know, P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, P6, P7, P8, P9 then the leading principal minors are uh, the minors that are on the main diagonal. So the first one would be just the top left corner. The second one would be the top left corner and the, sub the two by two submatrix that is always on the main diagonal. The third one would be the whole matrix itself. So the Sylvester criterion says, uh, suppose that it says that all the different um, minors, Q1, which is equal to P1, has to be bigger than zero. Q2, which is equal to the determinant to P1, P2, P4, P5, has to be bigger than zero. Q3, which is the determinant of P, has to be bigger than zero, and so on, okay? So this is a convenient test to evaluate if a matrix is positive definite without having to actually calculate the eigenvalues because you just have to calculate the determinants of the leading principal minors. And it's, uh, this criterion allows us to easily the, uh, notice some tricks. For example, if you have, uh, um, suppose that you have a, just a two by two matrix, so this would be P1 bigger than zero, and this would be P1, P5, minus P4, P2, okay? So actually, we notice that we can, without loss of generality, write these as, they, as, as if they were symmetric matrices. So P2, P2, P3, P3, P6, P6. This would be equal to P2 square. So suppose that, so from the, suppose that the first component is bigger than zero. You already know if that the one, one element of a matrix is not bigger than zero, your matrix will never be a uh, positive definite. Uh, then if this is bigger than zero, this is a squared term and it's negative, so for sure, the element, the other element on the diagonal has to be bigger than zero as well. If it's negative, your, your, your matrix will not, never be positive definite. And simple things like this. And then we mentioned the, this concept of detectability. I don't really want to explain it. Um, I am kind of forced to, to talk to you about it because it shows up in the, in the, in the conditions to solve LQR. But, uh, and it's not that I don't want to talk to you about it because uh, I don't like the argument. It's just because it really makes sense to talk about it next class because it comes out, out of a uh, logical uh, thought process when we will talk about estimators. But uh, for now, just for convenience, we will uh, take it as a definition and uh, we'll just uh, think about it as if it's a dual problem. Does anybody know what observability is, detectability is? Did you ever see it before? Some. Okay, well, so we'll talk about it better uh, next class, but for now, just keep in mind that it's pretty much the same thing as controllability, only it's the dual problem. It's, it's, uh, it doesn't really tell you what's the effect of the input on the state, but it tells you what's your ability, that's the effect of the state on the output, so to speak. But what matters is that you can test if a system is observable by creating, looking at the rank of an observability matrix in the same way as we did with reachability last class, and the observability matrix has this form. Um, so we define a system to be detectable if, uh, if there are some, some of these components, some of these modes that are not observable, well, as long as those modes are stable, then uh, the, the, as long as we can observe all the modes that are not stable, the system is detectable. And it's the same thing with the controllability. Have you ever uh, been told the difference between controllability and stabilizability? 
right? So basically, a system is controllable or reachable, which is the same thing for continuous time systems, when uh, you can actually, the input can affect all the different states. But what if uh, you can't affect some? Well, if those states are naturally already stable, you don't really care about it. So you call the system stabilizable in the sense you, as long as you can go and fix the ones that are broken, as long as you can fix the modes of the system that are unstable, then the system is considered stabilizable. It's the weaker condition of controllability as detectability is the weaker condition of observability. So what is, oh, okay, I guess it's time for a break. I even remembered this time. Okay, so please uh, take a seat. We've got a long way to go. Probably longer than we'll manage, but doesn't really matter. Okay, so we reached the general formulation of the LQR problem. Now we have, uh, uh, we can uh, look at our, our look, step back a little bit and understand mathematically what is it that we really want to do, okay? So what we're really asking, uh, uh, what the problem really is, is given a bunch of matrices, some of which have special properties. For example, the weighting matrices Q and R, are um, positive, definite, and symmetric. Then, we want to find uh, an input signal, and we're not imposing anything on the input signal. We don't say we want the input signal to base state feedback. No, like, we just want to find some input signal such that it minimizes the cost function. So this weird thing here, this weird notation, I don't know if you've ever seen it before, but the arg min of something, Arg means uh, it's the argument, which you can interpret as the solution. It's the solution to the minimization under the variable u. So the only thing that you're changing based on which you're trying to do your minimization is what you write underneath the min of uh, the function j. So the u is the solution of the minimum of the problem of minimizing by switching u, Jesus, sorry, <laughs> um, by minimizing uh, u, sorry, by changing u, you want to minimize this cost function. And the cost function is given by the sum of three terms. Notice, here I dropped the dependency on time just for, for clarity, but each one of these signals, u, x, and uh, u, are functions of time, of course. They're u of t's, x of t's, okay? Notice how now we've got, uh, we're weighing a term that is based, of course, the cost of the input, another one which is some uh, uh, measurement of the uh, tracking error of the states, no longer of the controlled output, and there's a weird cross term, okay, which we'll deal with and then we'll see what to do with it later. So, but this minimization is not just find the U, whatever you want, that it works. It's constrained. It's constrained by what? By the fact that X is related to you in a specific way. It's related to you by the system dynamics, okay? So this is what is called a constrained minimization problem. There are two ways to solve, uh, maybe there are many more, but the, the classical way to solve um, uh, constrained optimization problems, which are typically complex problems, and this is the gateway to, to a lot of modern control stuff that you can do beyond the linear quadratic control, the way, the proper general approach, mathematical approach to solve this problem is based on something called calculus of variations. Uh, it is really beyond the scope of this course to get into calculus of variations. You're going to have a course on purpose that is called optimal control where you're going to study all the details of all the nuisances of how constrained optimization works. So we'll try to solve this problem without actually using the proper tools. So you'll have to follow me on this. And we'll solve it by writing it, rewriting this cost function in a smart way. And, but before we proceed, we have to convince ourselves that the way is smart and it actually works. So what if I told you we rewrite this cost function as a sum of two terms? Let's suppose that it's possible. Then we'll see if and under which conditions it is possible. We want to write it as a sum of two terms, a J0 and a, a, an integral part that depends on the weighted uh, two norm of the difference between a signal U of T and some other signal. Let's call it U naught of T. Okay? Now, the conditions we want to pose is that this g naught, j naught, has to be a constant, basically, okay? And a constant in the sense that it's uh, 
constant with respect to the only variable that we're changing in our minimization process, which is u. So it's constant with respect to u of t, okay? Which is, uh, if you want to impress uh, people when you talk about this, call it a feedback invariant, which is uh, what, how you would find it on textbooks. But all it means is, like, if you change u, that doesn't change, okay? So if we say that this is a constant term, and then there's another term that depends on actually u, but it has this formulation. Now, we, if you remember the definition of a quadratic form, we said this has to be different from zero for, and for, every sign, for every vector that multiplies this that is different from zero, of course, because whatever the R is, it could be positive definite, it could be an arbitrary matrix. If you multiply it left and right by two zero vectors, of course, the result is zero. So the cool thing is that this becomes a zero if u is equal to u naught of t. No? So if we have a term that is constant and another term that varies but is equal to zero at a specific value of u, would you be convinced that that u is actual, actually the u that minimizes the problem? Considering that this is a quadratic form because r is definite positive, so this whole term here is positive. So we have a constant, j0, at which we can only add the stuff, which is represented by the second term of the integral. If we manage to make that second term of the integral that we know that it's positive zero, well, we have converged at a minimum, which is exactly what we should do by solving this problem. So tell me, raise your hand if you're convinced that if we write it in this form and we find the u equal to u naught, we find the minimum of the problem. Because if you're not convinced about this, it's pointless to proceed. Maybe somebody is not convinced. Why are you not convinced? And now you need to, it was easier to raise your hand. <laughs> okay, so I'll say it again another time. Um, the idea is, uh, if you all know how to do derivatives, right? If you have a function, you know that you can take derivatives. How do you find the minimum of a function or all the extrema, minimum, maximum, whatever it is? You do the derivative, you find where the derivatives are equal to zero, and then you look at the sign of, uh, in the neighborhood of the function, and then you tell if it's a minimum or a maximum, right? So the proper way of solving this constraint minimization problem would be along that line. The calculus of variation, it's like a general way to say, let's calculate the derivatives of these weird functions and functionals and stuff. It's like a generalization, if you want, of, of doing derivatives and putting them equal to zero under some constraints. But we don't want to do that because it's, there's lots of theory behind that it's beyond the scope of this class. But if we manage to rewrite that term as a constant function that has nothing to do with u, so whatever you change u, the, that constant term remains constant, plus something that is necessarily positive and depends on u. If we find the u that makes the positive part go to zero, well, then we found the minimum. Does it make sense? Maybe. Oh, whatever. So. Um, this is a representation of this, of, of, of this concept. We just find the u that uh, minimizes the cost function, and uh, if we manage to write the cost function in this form, it will be u naught. Now, so what are we going to do now? We're going to try to rewrite this function as this one. And we'll do this in two steps. So brace it, first step, second step, big math, put everything together, let's see what happens. So, First step is we need to find a feedback invariant. We need to find something that doesn't change if you, uh, if you, if you change the u. So suppose there exists a sum of matrix P, and suppose it's symmetric. And suppose that the system is going to be asymptotically stable at the end. What does, it mean? what does it mean? It means that x of t will go to zero if time goes to infinity. So for now, these are just assumptions. Later on, we'll make sure that we verify these assumptions. So we could just write the integral of x transpose times this weird combination of a transpose p plus p a, just take it as it is, uh, plus this other term. And we will say that it's equal to uh, something that has to do with x naught, which, by the way, is the initial condition of our system, and this matrix p. So let's prove it. So the proof happens by simply evaluating the left side of the integral, and it's a straightforward. So let's say you start from the beginning, which is the left side of the equation. The first thing we do is just take the multiplications. So we've got x transpose a transpose p and the other term. And, um, and then we express this 2x transpose pb as the sum of two terms, as x transpose pb plus x transpose pb. And then, I'm oh, sorry, there's a u as well. 
And then again, this is the same trick we used three times already. These are all scalars, so the scalars are equal to their transposes. So we can just take the transpose of one and we write it as x transpose pbu plus u transpose b transpose b transpose x. Now, what do we do? We just uh, um, gather left and right some terms. What are we trying to do? We're trying to highlight the constraint, the dynamics of the system. Remember that x dot is equal to ax plus bu. So by just looking at these terms carefully, we can see that uh, we can just uh, take ax plus bu here, which is common to the terms that have x transpose p, and uh, this other part here, which actually happens to be x dot transpose, and you can check that for yourself. So this part is equal, which by the way is in dt, it's equal to x dot t uh, transpose times px uh, plus the other form. And this is the derivative of uh, uh, the matrix form. So very similarly to how you would take the derivative of a product of two terms. Let's say you have the derivative in time of uh, f times g, okay? This is equal to the first one derived uh, times the second one not derived plus f g dot, right? This we all know. If you apply the same concept to this matrix representation, we have the derivative of uh, x transpose p x in uh, dt. Of course, x is a function of time, p is not. I'm just not writing it down for sake of notation. Then this would be following the same approach as before, x transpose dot p x plus x transpose p x dot which is exactly what we, we have here. So this can be expressed like the derivative of this term, but of course doing the integral in time of a derivative in time is just a very, uh, 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 um, it's just a way to say, so we know that the, the, the solution to the integral is gonna be this part here, but we have to evaluate it uh, 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 between the extremes. So this is actually equal to x transpose px evaluated between infinity and zero. So this gives us, uh, as we all know, the, this function evaluated at infinity, which means the limit as time goes to infinity of this function, minus this thing evaluated in zero. And uh, xt evaluated in zero is nothing but x naught, our initial condition of the system. So here is where the condition of asymptotic stability comes in. This goes to zero, so we just showed that the left side of the equation is equal to the right one. Okay, this is just Let's take it as it is for now. Then, let's push one step forward. It's uh, just ugly math, but then everything will come uh, together at the end. So, let's say that uh, we have a general expression, okay, of some random vector W multiplied by a matrix M minus uh, two, and B is another random vector. We will show that this equation holds. This equation is called uh, uh, square completion. And uh, it's just a matrix generalization of uh, uh, the, the same thing that applies to, 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 to simple algebraic um, second order equations. So how do we prove this? We prove this by doing uh, the direct multiplication of the right side of the equation and showing that it's equal to the left side. So uh, we get uh, W transpose minus uh, B transpose M minus one transpose times M. And we can just put this omega minus M inverse B. M times M inverse, this goes away. Minus B transpose M inverse B. This is equal to omega transpose M W's plus W transpose minus W transpose B minus W transpose M. So uh, M is symmetric here. I think I have not written it, but M is sim. So this is the inverse uh, times M times W. This goes away and I have all the terms. One, two, three. And we miss one, B transpose M inverse B. Minus minus is a plus, plus the other term that was here, B transpose M inverse B. This and this go away, and we should have the starting point 
the sum of these two is my, these are scalars, we can do the transposes, so it's minus two B transpose omega. So this is just a way to rearrange terms. But now let's look at these two, uh, in, in the particular case of our function, let's just look at these two terms. And uh, if we just apply exactly what we had before, we see that it's easy to write them as uh, something that is similar to the objective we want to reach, like this u minus u naught part, right? So, so, well, it's pretty straightforward because now we're just applying the equation where this time a w is actually u. You can see the relationship between uh, the formulations we have and the b in this case is, uh, um, so b transpose is of the equation above, it's our equivalent of minus 2n plus bb. And uh, so if, and m is the equivalent of uh, our matrix R. So if you just uh, uh, do the matching of the, of, the, of the multivariate square completion equation that we just uh, shown, you get this equation here. And this is very comf nice because we can directly go and evaluate u naught, which is uh, uh, the equivalent of minus uh, m inverse b, which turns out to be minus r inverse n plus pb transpose. And this is the solution to the LQR problem. So it's, uh, it, is it the solution to the LQR problem? Well, uh, we will see at the next slide how if we put everything together, this ends up being the solution, but uh, it's kind of, uh, uh, I, I gave away the surprise by calling it uh, u naught, uh, and uh, I convinced you before that u naught was the solution. So you must say, ah, but this was easy. Well, uh, not really, because uh, this all verges now on this P matrix, which I sort of stood up and said, hey, suppose there is a P matrix, no? and uh, it's a magic matrix that makes everything work. So yes, we do have an expression of, the, of this u naught signal. It looks like uh, it's a state feedback signal, which means like we put this class in the right order in the course. It's, it's good. Uh, but it, uh, we can notice that this uh, feedback coefficient KLQR does not depend on time. It's a static, which is nice. But there is a catch. The catch is we don't know what P is. And uh, if we don't know what P is, there's, uh, it's not very useful, right? So the question now is how do you find P? Um, and, and, and this will be the what. So first, let's, let's rewrite things together and let's see what, uh, if we find any hint that could help us determine what, what P is. And remember that we assumed the two things about P. We said it was symmetric and we said that it had to guarantee asymptotic stability of the system. So the question now becomes what is P and uh, how to get it to actually do what we assumed it should do. So we have determined these two equations and now we just want to plug them back into the original problem and try to see what happens. So we start from the general formulation of the LQR. This is what we derived at the first uh, thing. We have three terms and we talked about them already. Step one was this equation here. Notice, this equation here can be simply rewritten as suppose I remove this equal here, put this as a plus, and this is equal to zero, correct? So all this left side of the equation is just a very complicated way of saying zero. I'm just bringing one part on the other side. So, well, if it's a zero, it means it's zero, right? So I can always add a zero to a function and I'm not, to an equation, and I'm not changing the, the, the truth of it, right? Because if you add zero, you're not changing anything. So that's exactly what we did here. We're adding this big zero to this big zero to the original uh, cost function. What happens is that now we have x not, the term with x naught that goes out of the integral because it's no longer a function of time, it's a constant. x naught is the initial condition. And then we have these terms inside the integral that somehow go and, uh, uh, go and uh, match with the ones that were already there. So you see we have uh, a term in uh, uh, x transpose x, and we had a q in x transpose x here. So now we just gathered these together. We have a transpose p plus pa, which comes from here, and q that comes from there. And the same we do for the other two terms. Nothing really fancy going on here. Now, step two. Step two was recognizing, guess why we came out with that random combination of, of terms? Well, because we took care of this. No, lo look what's, re what's left. It's in, in the original problem that we're trying to rewrite in a smart way. 
Uh, it turns out that this is exactly the same as uh, what we saw could be expressed in a different way. So, um, so if we just recall what we derived at the previous slide, again, we just now substitute this right-hand side of the equation inside the, uh, this term here. What happens is that we effectively get the shape and form of the cost function that we liked, but who's who? So definitely the u minus u naught term here is the one we keep inside the integral. But then we have a nasty term inside the integral here as well that goes and sum up with this other nasty term here. So we just bring everything outside the integral and we call it the j naught because we are forcing the cost function to have this, this form because it's the only thing that makes sense in order to solve the minimization problem. Unless you wanted to use calculus of variations, of course. Uh, so basically, we did achieve uh, rewriting the cost function in this term, but what is J naught? J naught is the X naught plus P X naught transpose P X naught, which is the constant term that comes out from the first term, plus everything that we don't like that was still inside the integral. But we said that this J naught, in order for things to make sense, for U of T to be actually, for U naught of T to actually be the minimizing solution, J naught had to be a feedback invariant. This thing had to be uh, had to be a constant term. So the only way, maybe not the only, but a way to make this uh, term be zero is just by taking this whole big mess here and imposing it to be equal to zero. And uh, so the good news is that this whole big mess has the P matrix inside, the P matrix that we just assumed uh, to exist and do some good stuff. So now we have a constraint equation. We say, hey, look at this big mess. If we, find, if we were to find the P such that this whole thing is equal to zero, and hopefully the system is even asymptotically stable if you use that P in the feedback uh, loop, then we would be game. The problem would be solved. It turns out that this big equation is actually a very famous equation, and it's called the algebraic Riccati equation. Okay. The algebraic Riccati equation uh, has a slightly different form. So the first thing we do is just uh, uh, rearrange the, the condition that we found in order to uh, match the, the classical form of the, uh, the ARE. And how do we do this? Well, we just do the multiplications. There is no fancy math going on here. And uh, we gather the terms that are left mul right multiplied by p, left multiplied by p, the quadratic terms in p, and everything else. And um, it should be straightforward here to see that if we just do the multiplications, it's just a boring process. I'll just show a, a passage, maybe. Uh, we got nr inverse plus pbr inverse times n transpose plus b, b transpose b transpose p plus q equal to zero. Of course, this term stays the same. Then we continue doing the multiplications, r n r inverse n transpose plus n r inverse b transpose p plus p b p b r inverse n n transpose plus p b r inverse b transpose p plus q. So now you can see that we had one term that was left multiplied by p, a transpose. Okay, let's start from the other one that is slightly simpler. We have the left multiplied by p term that was only multiplied by a, but then if we go and look in here, we have this other term that has, is left multiplied by p. So all we're doing is we're just gathering the terms in the same way. So yes, it's boring math, but uh, the whole point of this linear quadratic regulator thing is that from now on, when you use it, you'll focus on the high level knobs. You'll just go play around with the weights of the different terms to make things happen. And then you're gonna have a computer that does all the calculations. But at least once you need to see what the computer does so that you convince yourself that it actually makes a sense and there is something going on behind that that, that, that is uh, intelligible. So, uh, if we organize all these terms, we get, and we just relabel them, and we call this big mess A tilde, transpose, this other big mess A tilde, this is R tilde, and this is Q tilde, we get the standard form 
or at least a particular case of the standard form of the of an algebraic Riccati equation. So, um, what can I say about this? Uh, this is uh, a continuous time algebraic Riccati equation. You could find the variation on the theme in discrete time. Uh, the ones of you that are working with the second hardware exercise um, might have noticed that you're not using exactly this formulation because anytime, every time you implement something, you're dealing with uh, uh, discrete times, and this has a slightly different version in discrete time. We could write chapters of books on how to solve this. There's very different variations. Uh, there's the, um, uh, the general form actually has a time dependent term on the right side, uh, but we are not considering, we, we have this a simpler version because of uh, uh, the fact that we're considering an LQR problem over an infinite horizon. But these are all details. So what we want to care about, what we care about is finding now the solving this equation in the unknown P. So remember that A, R, and Q is all stuff that we know. A comes from the knowledge of the system, comes from the knowledge of the system and the weighing matrices that are uh, design parameters. You choose them. Uh, the R matrix, again, is a function of B and B, which is stuff that we know, uh, and R, which is a weight that you use at the beginning. So all these terms are known. What is it that is unknown is P. And that's exactly what we're looking for. Uh, with some uh, uh, creative, uh, uh, so the, 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 the nice thing about um, algebraic Riccati equations is that we can just rewrite them in, uh, in this form. And this is just, uh, um, it's just rewriting this equation by prea multiplying by P minus I. And uh, this highlights this, uh, this construct which is called the Hamiltonian matrix associated with the uh, algebraic Riccati equation. And it turns out that uh, the whole deal, if or not this uh, equation has a solution, depends on properties of this matrix. So one thing we can note is that this matrix um, is, uh, uh, if, if we take a, a transformation T that is defined in this way, then uh, we can see that uh, H is equal to its, it's related to its, uh, to minus uh, H conjugate transpose, the Hermitian version. So when this happens, what it's telling you is that the spectral properties of the two matrices are related because we're just doing similarity transformations. And uh, this tells us that uh, this Hamiltonian matrix, which by the way has a, a, a dimension of 2n by 2n, because A is n is the state of the system. So this is an n by, this is an n by n. Q is a function, is uh, an n by n as well. So what this uh, uh, similarity transformation tells us is that the spectrum of U is symmetric with respect to the imaginary axis. So if we were to just plot out the eigenvalues of this big Hamiltonian matrix, if it had a few here, then it would have a few in the symmetric side as well. Okay? So if we make an assumption now and we say, look, let's just make sure that there are no eigenvalues that happen to be exactly on the imaginary axis. If we assume that there are no eigenvalues on the imaginary axis, then uh, because of this relationship of this property of the Hamiltonian matrix to, uh, to have symmetric eigenvalues with respect to the imaginary axis, we could say for sure that there are half of the eigenvalues that are stable and half of them are unstable. Half in the left plane, half in the right plane. Now, um, we, um, if we just take the Hamiltonian matrix, we find the eigenvalues, and there are 2n, remember, because it has a 2n dimension. And we just divide the ones that are stable, let's say, let's indicate them with a minus, so, and these are going to be n, and then we find the other ones that are the unstable ones, and we know for sure that half on the right and half on the left plane. And we focus only on the stable ones. And then 
we find the eigenvectors v1 to vn that are associated to the stable eigenvalues, and we just stack them up. Like this. Consider that these are n stable eigenvalues, but each eigenvector will have the dimension of the Hamiltonian matrix. So this means that each vi has dimension 1 by actually 2n by 1. So if we stack them all up together, we're going to have 2n by n. And uh, if we just do this, we stack all the eigenvectors associated with the stable eigenvalues, and then we just partition this matrix here. And uh, we partition it such that we get two square matrices, and we call the top one x1, the bottom one x2. And this is nothing but the collection of all the stable eigenvectors, so to speak. Then it can be shown that the solution to the, uh, to the algebraic Riccati equation is given by these two subcomponents of the stable subspace. Now, this is a little bit of a mess, but, um, but what can I say? Uh, I can say that uh, this is the, we're not going to be using this very much, so don't worry about it, but uh, just for a teaser, for those of you who might be interested in the future, this concept of uh, finding spaces that are associated with particular eigenvectors that have special properties, for example, the stable ones, the unstable ones, or the ones that are zero, um, opens the doors for a, full, a whole theory and controls that it's like the geometric approach to control systems, and it's the, the spaces that are spanned by these stable or unstable eigenvectors are called autospaces, and uh, it's really interesting. We could rewrite everything that we saw based on, these, uh, on, on this uh, new way of, of looking at things. It's particularly useful in nonlinear controls. So if you are going to go forward, these are the kind of things you're going to see a lot. And uh, it's not going to be useful for the rest of the class, but just keep in mind that this is the gateway to a different way to see the whole problem of control by uh, looking at. So these, these, these auto spaces play key roles in the stability and performances of, of, of uh, the evolution of dynamical systems. So anyways, so if it's possible to write down this, uh, find these eigenvectors, and they're such that the X1 matrix is actually invertible, then we have a solution. So for now, let's just make two assumptions. And we say, hey, H has no eigenvalues on the imaginary axis, no purely imaginary eigenvalues, which is the only thing that we really would break down this, this argument, because then we couldn't say we have N on the left and N on the right. And then let's suppose again that x1 is invertible. Then the solution is given by that. And actually, one could say, um, so it's actually we're lucky enough that turns out this solution is even stabilizing in the sense that if you use it in the feedback control problem, it generates asymptotic stability. And uh, typically speaking, the algebraic Riccati equation has many solutions. And um, not all of them have uh, nice properties. Not all of them are even uh, stable, stabilizing. Uh, but if the Hamiltonian matrix satisfies these two assumptions, we, it is said, it is typically called, uh, it is said that it belongs to the domain of the Riccati equation. And, uh, and these two assumptions are critical in order to find the right P that we need. And we could prove in detail uh, exactly why this is happening. Maybe we can give it a quick uh, uh, look at, but I would like to focus on an exercise because I feel that it would be nice to look at a practical application of all of this. So let's just quickly um, enunciate the, the, the theorem. So let's say that the Hamiltonian matrix actually satisfies the two properties that we like. It's possible to find the, uh, a, a stable matrix. Uh, H stable means that all the eigenvalues have negative real part, such that this condition holds. And uh, through this condition, we can uh, show some properties of P. It's possible to show that P, expressed, of course, in the construct that we saw before, is real and symmetric. It's definitely possible to show that it's the solution of the Riccati equation. And uh, it shows that this uh, A tilde, R tilde, P is actually stable. And, uh, and, uh, and so for the first part, I will just tell you go check the references, because to prove the first part, we need to introduce other mathematical concepts that would be just uh, um, 
not necessary for the rest of what we're doing. But uh, so if you take this, uh, this, uh, um, this formulation and you just uh, pre and post multiply it by uh, P minus I and X1 inverse, and you do the calculations, it turns out that uh, you can actually obtain on the left-hand side the Hamiltonian matrix. And actually, this is not the Hamiltonian matrix. This is the whole uh, I, the algebraic required equation. This was exactly the form in which we represented it before. And on the left-hand side, oh, sorry, this is a mistake in parsing. This is not a matrix uh, like this. This is a parenthesis x2 minus x2, which is actually equal to zero. That's just badly parsed. So it just comes from the uh, multiplying p times x1 minus x2, but p is equal to x2, x1 inverse. So you do the calculations, and it turns out to be x2 minus x2. So what does this show? It shows that if we start from this construct and we just do multiplication by known terms, we have, uh, and we use the fact that p is actually uh, has a, this particular expression, we satisfy the Riccati equation. So this shows that p is a solution for the Riccati equation. Uh, then we just want to look at this last step because it's important. The fact is that uh, we um, can show that this uh, A tilde plus R tilde P is a stable matrix. Um, apart from how we show it, I think the most interesting part is uh, understanding that uh, if we just uh, uh, rewrite what the expressions of A tilde and R tilde were, you would get exactly the expression of the state feedback term. Um, this is to say we have x dot equals ax plus bu, right? And we found out through uh, minimizing the cost function that the optimal u to solve the LQR problem is uh, some uh, uh, state feedback form where the gain is this k, and we found an expression of the gain, which was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, minus R inverse M plus uh, BP transpose. So if we close the loop, the closed loop, so you substitute L in here, what you get is um, X dot equals A plus actually minus A minus uh, B R inverse N plus B P transpose X. So this becomes the closed loop transfer function. It's very similar to when we did state feedback, but now we're not placing the poles, but the machinery is somehow placing the poles in some way. It would be interesting to look what it's actually doing. Of course, it depends on how you play around with the weights. But the idea is that in order to have asymptotic stability, which was necessary in order to write the equation in the form we liked, this has to be a Hermitian matrix. It has to be a stable matrix. It has to have uh, um, all eigenvalues with negative real part. And it turns out that uh, a P chosen in this way actually shows that this part is uh, stable because it's a similar function to, it's a similar matrix to a stable function. And this is exactly the closed loop transfer function. So a P chosen in this way guarantees asymptotic stability of the system. Now the question is, uh, so this, all of this is a mess, I realize it, um, but let's make a short summary. Up to now, we have determined that uh, uh, there is a solution to the LQR problem if we formulate it in the way we formulated it. There are many other ways of doing it, but we are considering a continuous time, a deterministic uh, uh, description of the problem, and we're considering um, an infinite horizon. The integral is done in infinite time. We saw that the solution exists, and it actually has the form of a state feedback. And uh, in order to find, though, the, the actual coefficient of the state feedback, the gain, we had to solve, uh, we have to find this matrix P. And to find the matrix P, we had to solve this messy algebraic Riccati equation. And it turns out that in order for the algebraic Riccati equation to have a P that we like, that is stabilizing and is symmetric and has the nice properties, two conditions have to apply. The Hamiltonian matrix associated with the uh, algebraic Riccati equation needs to have no eigenvalues on the imaginary axis, and the subspace x1 needs to be invertible. 
Uh, so the last step we really, really need to do is, uh, is, is find an easy way to, to, to derive technical properties on the system itself or on the weights that we choose such that we automatically satisfy these two conditions. So we don't have to worry about going and finding this Hamiltonian matrix and checking stuff. So I'll spare you the actual proof, but the, the conditions that show up are two. And one is pretty obvious. We're doing state feedback, right? So what was the condition on state feedback that was necessary and sufficient for placing the poles? It was that the system had to be reachable, right? Well, here we're doing state feedback, so it's natural to, to, to expect that we have uh, a condition that tells us, well, you, this works only if your system is reachable, basically. And that's what the first condition tells us. It tells us that the system has to be stabilizable, not reachable. It's, 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 it's a weaker condition. It, has, it says that only the unstable poles actually are the ones you need to control. And then, uh, in order to actually have uh, a unique solution that is uh, uh, stabilizing and it's positive definite and has all nice properties, then we require the, um, the pair uh, A tilde Q tilde, which is, 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 has this, uh, this relationship with the different uh, weights that, and, 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 and the parameters of the system that uh, has to be detectable, it has to be observable. Now, for now, we'll just uh, take it like this, but we will see that uh, um, in some cases, this, uh, this uh, if, especially if, I mean, not in some cases, when n is equal to zero, this becomes the pair aq, which is related directly. If this is observable, we can show that ae is observable, which is uh, basically the observability of the system based on the controlled outputs. So what is the takeaway here? The takeaway is every time you do state feedback, you want to have your system that is reachable. And uh, the second condition, we can intuitively think about it. Uh, so we created a construct, this Z function, that is a controlled output that isn't really the measured outputs of the system. But uh, for the cost function to actually be able to take into account what's going on in this evolution of the states, uh, there needs to be this property that is satisfied. This property is saying that the performance index, the cost function, actually is able to see everything that is going on in the system. Another way of thinking about it is that we're guaranteeing through this condition that the system is internally stable. Internally stable means there's none of the X's that goes to infinity, that blows up, okay? If one of these X's were to blow up, our cost function would go to infinity. If the cost function goes to infinity, nothing would work. So, so this is the, the two real only conditions that need to be applied in order for the LQR problem to actually work. So yeah, this I mentioned before, the idea is that if we put n equal to zero, then uh, this becomes directly uh, the detectability of uh, aq, and q is a function of e transpose, so this becomes directly of, uh, the detectability of ae, which is the detectability of the system. So. All we're saying here is that this condition is such that the cost function actually sees what's going on with the states. We will explain this better next class because we'll talk about estimation, and estimation is, is all about figuring out how these states evolve uh, from looking only at the outputs. So, simple recipe. Uh, I actually have a spelled out example where we can calculate all of this in two different ways, so it hopefully makes everything a little bit more clear. So the first way of, of solving the problem, so the whole problem here is, is, is uh, for finding the state feedback to solve the LQR problem is determining this P solution of the algebraic Riccati equation. To find the P solution of the algebraic Riccati equation, we want to find the Hamiltonians, find the stable eigenvalues, find the associated eigenvectors, stack them up, partition, invert one of the two sides. So it's not as bad as it looks, okay? <laughs> but <laughs> it takes some practice, you know? Or there is another way. Uh, we wanted to do the elegant mathematical subspace, whatever, but one can even just plug in the numbers and solve it brutally by hand, okay? Which is what we're going to do as well now. Of course, uh, the brutal approach, we're going to do it like in 45 seconds, but the brutal approach is, of course, uh, works well when you have a 2x2 two two system, a 3x3 three three and lots of spare time, but already if you do it with a 4x4, four four, good luck, okay? So, I mean, we will not necessarily go through all of this, but you can go through all of this at home because it's spelled out in detail. So the idea is that suppose we have a system we want to control, the A matrix is given, the B matrix is given, 
The cost function is something that you decide. So for some reason, the, the, for some design purposes, we say, no, we only care about minimizing the x1 state, because that's relevant to us for some reason. And we want, of course, minimize the cost, and we weigh equally the two terms. So this is telling us directly what the Q matrix and R matrices are. You can just go, the Q matrix was the weight on the states, and the R matrix is the weight on the, on the input. Make sure that these functions, Q and R, have to be symmetric and have to be positive definite. And you will verify that both these things are uh, happening. Um, we will go through the rest of this uh, next class. Uh, next class is a continuation of this one anyways. So.